Okay, let's make a, a start. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. The sun is shining again. That makes me that makes me happy. Um, uh, we've got one last lecture on uh, scalar first order equations. Um, I find this topic kind of fun. It's it's uh, it's sort of uh, different uh, than uh, all of the other stuff that we've uh, sort of focused on. Uh, with um, partial differential equations, which has mostly been uh, series solutions. We'll go on, we'll do some transform solutions uh, coming up, which are sort of related to the idea of series solutions. Uh, find a few more Green's functions for some standard problems. Uh, but, uh, but this is a little bit different, these kind of uh, hyperbolic conservation laws uh, with shock waves and how you uh, resolve them. Um, Okay, uh, let me uh, bring up the, the whiteboard uh, and exit full screen so I can see the uh, Slack channel with the teaching assistant. Oh, and I can click there as much as I want, but it's here. Okay, so. Uh, we're going to go over the hyperbolic conservation law uh, uh, last uh, little bit, and then um, uh, we'll go on to uh, fully nonlinear uh, problems. Okay, so let's uh, consider uh, the uh, R.P. Riemann problem uh, for these hyperbolic conservation laws. Uh, and I'm going to consider uh, two cases which are really the same, uh, except for a sign change, uh, where this flux function is convex. So that's where the uh, second derivative is positive. So I could say strictly convex. This is for all uh, u. Uh, that means that the derivative of f is increasing. Uh, and remember the derivative of f is the uh, characteristic uh, speed. So the example we have for this one is uh, Berger's equation where f of u is one half u squared. And then of course, uh, you can imagine you're gonna have a, a, a related but sort of opposite in some way case where uh, uh, f is concave. That's when the second derivative is negative for all u. And we had the example from the traffic flow model that we developed last time, uh, which was f of u is u minus u squared. Okay, so let's look at uh, case number one, uh, the Riemann problem in that case. So uh, remember, I just said f prime is increasing if the second derivative is positive. Uh, and uh, F prime is the characteristic speed. So if we look at the Riemann problem with left constant values, left of zero, bigger than right constant values, uh, right of zero as initial conditions, uh, this has to lead to a shock wave because the stuff traveling on the left is faster than the stuff traveling on the right. So I'll have a shock wave. We've got the uh, rankine hugonio condition that says that the shock speed has to be uh, the uh, difference uh, of F values divided by the difference in right values. Okay, and here is a nice uh, picture. I'm not really a geometric thinker. Uh, I'm much more of an algebraic thinker, but this is a nice picture for, for those of you that like, uh, like uh, to understand ideas with, uh, with uh, 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 sort of geometric ideas. Here's my F. You can see it's convex. Uh, I've got my left is bigger than my right value. Uh, and you'll notice 
that this shock speed, this is the slope of that secant line. Right. So I can look at the derivative here and the derivative here. Uh, and I can see just from this picture uh, that if I look at F prime at U right, that's slower than the shock speed. So that means those characteristics are going into the shock and it's, uh, and the, Characteristic speeds on the left are faster than the shock speed. So the left is faster, so they're going into the shock. And so this is the lax entropy condition. So in the case of a convex function, uh, the, the, the questions of, gee, what happens with the Riemann problem are pretty simple. It's either a shock or a rarefaction, right? Uh, and there's, there's the one case. Now let's uh, stick uh, with, uh, with the case of uh, F as being convex, but look at the other case where UL is less than UR. That means the characteristic speeds on the left are less than the characteristic speeds on the right. So if we're gonna draw the picture in the xt plane, I've got these characteristics going out, right? And I've got these characteristics going up this way at a slower speed. I've made a negative, just, it's just less than, right? I don't know exactly what f is. And then I can get another color and go, the solution is not defined in here. Uh, but we started the discussion uh, last time uh, that there's a rarefaction wave in there. Whoop, whoop. Let me change back to black. So there's a rarefaction wave in there. We saw how this could come from uh, smoothing out the initial condition. So you have a smooth transition over a very uh, short uh, region uh, around uh, x equals zero. <clears throat> and so we're going to have solutions that are going to be on these lines. Right. And where do I need this? Right. I need to fill in that red region. So that's C going from F prime at U R to F prime at UL. And remember, uh, if I'm on a line with slope C and I want the solution to figure out um, what, um, uh, what value I have to be on, uh, it's that uh, the, uh, the value U on those lines, right? If it's gonna be a characteristic, uh, has to be, those are uh, lines that are moving with speed C so the U has to correspond to uh, the uh, wave speed being that speed, okay? So uh, I can draw this picture again. Now I've got UL is left less than UR on my uh, picture. Uh, let me make it a little bit more convexy. Uh, and this was this was uh, f of u. Now, if I graph f prime of u, it's positive between u l and u r, but increasing. Uh, and of course, here I've got f prime at u l. Here I've got f prime at u r. 
and now, of course, what I'm interested in is looking at this uh, graph uh, uh, as an inverse problem. I want to say I'm sitting on one of these lines with speed c. And I want to know the value of u that it should correspond to, right? Uh, and uh, this is the value, right? And you can see as you go from f prime at ul to f prime at ur, you go in values between ul and ur. So this is gonna be a continuous solution, right? As long as you're not at time zero. Uh, and this is where I got confused before, uh, last time. It's actually, you look at the function f inverse, or f, sorry, you look at the function uh, f prime, so the derivative function, and you have to look at its inverse function, right? And this is all well-defined. Uh, this leads to a continuous uh, solution for time bigger than zero. So there's some smoothing that goes on in this process. Okay, and where I got confused last time is for um, Berg's equation, uh, the derivative uh, function, remember f is one half u squared. And so the derivative is just u. Oh, good question. How do we know that the inverse is well defined? Uh, well, because we uh, have this convex function and we're looking at the inverse of the derivative, but if the function's strictly convex, the derivative is positive, and so it's this picture. Uh, once you have a, a, a function with a derivative with only one sign, it, it has an inverse, right? Just if you don't know the inverse function theorem, you can just look at this picture and go, okay, yeah, this, this makes sense. It's if the derivative changes sign that you can, uh, 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 yeah, then in, in that case, the uh, inverse function is uh, not in general uh, uh, defined. Okay, and uh, of course for the concave case, it's exactly the same story, but with the signs of uh, the difference of UL and U are reversed, right? So uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, let me do some rarefaction examples because remember last lecture, I got a little bit confused. Uh, and, um, and again, now I understand why I was confused because if you're looking at the Berger's equation, let's look at this case. This is gonna lead to a rarefaction because remember, for the Berger's equation, the characteristic speeds are just the value of u. So I've got the left vertical lines and on the right, I've got lines of slope one. Uh, and so uh, I've got uh, this picture here. And uh, I have to fill in this thing with a rarefaction. And uh, here is where, uh, if you look at the derivative, it's just u. So it's just the identity function. And so if you look at the inverse of that function, well, it's just the identity. Uh, and so I can now say, I can have a formula for u of x and t. So it's zero if x is less than zero, that's over here. Right, uh, it's one if x is bigger than t, that's over here, right? And then in between, I am on a line uh, where um, uh, x is uh, bigger than zero, but less than t. In the notes I've written it as zero is less than x divided by t uh, is less than one. But okay, it's the it's the same expression, and in here, right? 
then it's x divided by t. And you can see how this is now going to be a continuous uh, solution uh, for time bigger than, than zero. OK, so that's what confused me. I was expecting something more complicated than uh, just uh, this identity. But it just happens this is the, the simplest uh, case. Uh, let's do a traffic flow model. Uh, U L is two thirds and U R is one third. Okay, this is uh, the concave case, so things go uh, the other way around. Let's just check. Uh, I've got F of U is U minus U squared. So the derivative, these are the characteristic speeds, look like this. And so I've got F prime at U L is minus one third, F prime at U R is one third. Um, and so uh, now you can see we're gonna have a rarefaction wave. Right, because I've got uh, UL is two thirds. I got heavy traffic out here. I've got light traffic out here. And I've got this rarefaction wave in here. And before we find the solution, uh, you can sort of get some physical intuition, right, about what's going on, right? You were in heavy traffic, but the front of the heavy traffic here uh, suddenly sees, uh, you know, less traffic, and so it can speed up, right? So if you imagine you were a car in this scenario, you're not moving at the characteristic speed, right? You're moving at uh, uh, at the speed f of u divided by uh, u, right? And so you'll be moving to the right and suddenly you'll start, you'll be able to speed up until uh, eventually you're in this clear low traffic zone that's up ahead, right? Uh, and that's a smooth transition that happens. And you notice that the traffic blockage, if you could think of it that way, is actually moving uh, backwards uh, in in time, which is kind of interesting. Uh, okay, so let's do let's do the math. We have to figure out the uh, inverse function uh, of f prime of u is one minus two u. I want to set that equal to c, and some easy algebra gives me uh, one minus c over two. That's looking at the value of u on this line, x is equal to ct. Okay, and uh, so that will give me a solution that looks like heavy traffic behind. Uh, the traffic blockage is moving uh, back in space and time, uh, yes. Yes, it is, right? Right? There's uh, free flowing, let's say, more free flowing traffic up ahead. Uh, and eventually, uh, you catch up to that, right? And all of these cars are moving faster, right? This is, uh, this is the, uh, the, the heavy traffic area, right? And this is the line uh, where uh, you have light traffic. And then you have this smooth transition uh, through there. It's an interesting question. Maybe I'll put this on an assignment uh, to, to look at this problem and see uh, what a, a car that started here experiences in time. OK, Ooh, excellent question. Um, uh, but now I got distracted by my interesting assignment question. Did I answer the student question that, that came in? Because that's more important.
Okay, no one's saying I didn't answer their 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 question. Okay, so um, oh, can I can I, I I think they're asking if it moves uh, negative in space and time. Like, is it moving backwards in time? Is what they are asking. Oh no, it's moving backwards in space. Yeah, we we can't solve these problems backwards in time. Now it's it's a little bit interesting. Um, Uh, these these problems, remember, uh, if there's a shock, there's some loss of information. So these problems are not time reversible. We're not talking about, uh, yeah, we're not talking about moving backwards in time. But if you were an observer sitting here, right, right? Here you are, you're an observer sitting here. And so you're, uh, you're looking at what's happening uh, there, right? And so what you would see is, oh, heavy traffic, heavy traffic. Oh, and then suddenly it starts to lighten, right? And uh, you won't ever see this, this uh, really light traffic, but you'll see uh, things uh, closer and closer to uh, this, uh, this value of traffic as, as, as you look. Um, now, like I say, it's, it's a different question. And like I said, this makes a good assignment question. I'm sorry, I, I love thinking of good assignment questions. Of If you were a car that was here, of course you would be moving to the right, right? Uh, but you'd also be moving in time. And so you would, you would have some sort of trajectory through the rarefaction uh, wave. I don't think you'd ever get out of it, but okay. That, that's that's an assignment question. I'll write it down, and if it's really hard, I'll make it a B a B question. Okay, now I got distracted again by my my thoughts of beautiful uh, assignment questions. Uh, I, have I answered the student question? I guess Let, let's go back to that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. So let's go back to filling out uh, this. Uh, uh, depiction of the of the solution. Uh, so I've got two thirds out here. Oh, that's less than minus t over three. Right. I've got one third if x is bigger than t over three. Maybe I should write this as. Um, yeah. No. No. I guess that is how I want to write it. And if I'm in between. Then I've got this expression, one minus x over t divided by two. Okay, and you can uh, check, right, that uh, this is continuous, right, in the sense that if I now uh, approach uh, x divided by t is minus one third, right, then I get a two thirds solution. And if I let x divided by t, so I'm on one of these lines that's approaching this side, approach one third, uh, then this is got value one third, right? So these are uh, matching up the way the way that you that you hope. Okay, so that ends the um, uh, hyperbolic uh, conservation law. Why is UL two thirds? Because I, I made it, that, that was my choice. UL here, remember, U is not the, uh, the speed. That's F prime of U. U is a scaled uh, density. So it's U not for speed, it's U for unknown. Right, so this is the high density, which moves slow. And this is the low density that moves fast. Okay. Any last questions on uh, hyperbolic conservation laws? You can expect um, on the next assignment some some Riemann problem questions, some uh, what time does the shock form questions, that kind of thing. Could you scroll up a bit? Uh, 
It, it was on a previous graph where I think maybe we mixed up uh, UR and UL, but so, so not this one, <laughs> maybe up some more. Some more is <laughs> is quite a yeah this one there we go. On this oh, one. this is um, this is a, a plot of f of u versus u. So uh, this r is not for for right on this graph. It's on the right side of the initial conditions. I see. I, I, okay. I think ul bigger than u r, and so uh, that's that's where that came from. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then on the same graph down here, when I had the sign change, right, then then it's it's switched. Right. And you can't you don't put a shock here because it won't satisfy the uh, lax entropy conditions. Right. If you if you can pick a shock speed from the Rankine Hugonio conditions, but then you'll find that the uh, uh, characteristics are coming out of the shock, uh, and that doesn't that doesn't make sense, right? Whereas this rarefaction solution uh, is is more uh, it's physical, right? And from the traffic flow model, right? You can you can sort of if you've driven in traffic, uh, you could sort of imagine how this this goes. Remember, this is a very simplistic model of traffic flow. Uh, lots of people have spent uh, time uh, studying that in, in more detail. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a um, uh, a fifty minute detour into a fully nonlinear first order scalar equations. So we had these conservation laws, they were uh, quasi-linear or quasi-linear, depending on how you say it. Uh, they were uh, not nonlinear in the derivatives. So now we're gonna have some, some actual uh, fully nonlinear equations that are nonlinear uh, in, uh, in the derivatives. And the easiest one to look at is something called the iconal equation, iconal equation. So I'm going to have u as a function of x and y. There's no time-like direction in these things. Uh, and I'll have u x squared plus u y squared is one over c squared of x and y. C is going to be a, a, a speed of propagation uh, that could vary in space. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll show you how that uh, comes up. Okay, so let's let's just get some examples. Uh, and the classic uh, iconal equation has uh, c identically equal to one. So let me look at those examples where I can actually make some analytic progress. Um, just like before, you have to give data on a on a curve. So I'm going to give a data on the x-axis which will just be a zero data. Uh, and I'll, I can have two solutions. In fact, you can show there's only two solutions. So there's two solutions. Okay, and you can go, well, uh, we had unique solutions before, what's happened here? Well, it's fully nonlinear, right? Once you write down the quadratic equation, you, you know that there are cases where uh, nonlinear equations have more than one solution. And in fact, the, you got some sort of squaring action going on here. This is not so surprising, right? Okay. Uh, here's another example. Sorry, um, quick question. How, how did those solutions solve the ODE or the differential equation? I don't uh, see it, maybe I'm just... Here, ui is equal to one and ux is equal to zero. Well, I can say yeah. plus or minus one. Oh, 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 okay. 
Okay, sorry. No, I was thinking it was u of y squared. Like, uh, okay, I, I thought it was going to be different. That's why I, I got it. Oh, okay. So uh, just in case anyone else is, is confused by this notation, this is the x derivative squared, right? This is what's making it fully nonlinear. I've got nonlinearities non in the partial derivatives. Okay, good, good. I'm glad you, uh, you asked so that everyone can be on the same page. Uh, here's another one. I'm gonna have data uh, u. Yeah, I, wanna, I wanna make that a little bit neater. Uh, u equals zero on the unit circle. And again, I'm gonna have two solutions, but only two, right? I'm gonna have u is plus or minus, and have the square root of x squared plus y squared minus one. So in polar coordinates, This is uh, plus or minus r minus one. Okay, uh, and you can just take the x derivatives, right, and the y derivatives, and square them, and you'll see that you get one. Okay, uh, and I can start you off. If you take the, uh, uh, let's go with black. If you take the x derivative with the plus sign. Right, I'm going to get uh, x divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared. There's a one half that comes from the uh, taking the derivative of the square root, but there's a two because you do the chain rule and you get the two x. Right, and now you can see if you have ui is y over the square root of x squared plus y squared, that if you square them and add them up, they add up to one. Okay, so. So there's a couple of solutions. So iconal equation, here we go. E for iconal equation. Um, so where does this come from? Um, okay, I think there's a, there's a question coming up in the chat. Uh, is there some hard and fast rule to know how many solutions you might have? No, 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 there isn't. Just like if you have a scalar uh, nonlinear equation, so that's finding the roots of a function, right? I can have uh, all kinds of different roots. Oh, look, I, it looks like I've drawn the vessel function, but uh, okay, yeah. Uh, that's not what I, 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 I meant to do necessarily. Uh, all kinds of roots. Uh, and so, yeah, how do you know beforehand? You got to do some hard thinking about the structure of the problem that, that you have. Um, I can show you, skipping some details, uh, I can show you where the non-uniqueness uh, uh, can come from. And uh, from that, maybe you can see, um, uh, for a general problem, uh, how many solutions that you've you've got, or maybe that you've only got one. Okay, so let's look at um, a, a derivation of the iconal equation. Uh, and it does come up in a number of applications. Uh, the thing that I'll talk about is uh, the minimal travel time problem. Uh, so um, I'm going to have uh, a data curve. Uh, with u equals zero on it. Right, and uh, in the application, this is going to be all of the places that I can start from at time zero. Uh, the C of X of Y is going to be a local speed. C of X and Y. So that is, uh, it's an isotropic uh, case where uh, it's, uh, it's 
uh, just as easy to move in any direction uh, at every point, but in some places you can move faster than, than others. So uh, I can tell you that the solution, uh, u of x and y uh, to uh, the iconal equation uh, is the minimal time it takes to get to uh, x, y from gamma. Okay, oh, data curve, gamma is, capital gamma is something that is often used in mathematics to represent a curve. So you can start uh, anywhere uh, on this curve. So of course, the time to get anywhere on this curve is no time, right? Right, and now you're out here, right? And of course, if C was one, right? Then the way to get there first would be to, uh, you know, hit this normal uh, 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 spot on the on the curve, uh, and this would be the path that would take you to this point x and y the fastest. Uh, and if c was identically equal to one, then the distance would be uh, this time. And if you solve the iconal equation, that's the time that you uh, that you get. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture before I show you the uh, the derivation. So for now, at least believe that that's what the iconal equation is doing. Uh, and it's it's a different story, uh, but it has some similarities with the. Uh, um, hyperbolic conservation laws that we had before. Uh, remember for those, we could have discontinuous solutions. Uh, and uh, when we did, we had to have a selection principle or a physical principle to decide uh, which solution we would take. Uh, remember when we had the shock with the characteristics coming in, that still doesn't tell you what the shock speed was. We had to uh, fall back on the conservation uh, principle idea to, uh, to actually make sense of the speed that this, that this discontinuity should be moving at. So it's not quite the same story uh, uh, for uh, this problem, <clears throat> but, um, but it, it's a little bit related. So here I'm gonna have a big X, Y plane on my picture. Uh, and here I'm gonna have U is equal to zero. Now you notice I haven't given it on a curve, I've just given it at a point, okay? But you'll see, of course, that, that that makes sense, right? You're allowed to say, if I started at this point, how long does it take me to get uh, anywhere, right? Um, and uh, he, here is a slow speed region in here. So this is C much less than much less than one, right? And here, out here, I'm going to have C equal one. So let's look at the level sets of U. Okay. Well, if I start at this point and it's all uniform speed, and I see how long uh, it uh, where I can get to in one second. So I'm looking for the U equals one level set. Well, it's just a circle, right? With uh, radius one. And uh, if I look at the uh, level set U equals two, that's everywhere I can get to uh, first in, uh, in, in uh, here going at speed two, right? So it's a circle, it's supposed to be a concentric circle, right? Okay, so I'm gonna have circles that go out. So now I'm not gonna draw all of the circle because now I'm interested in what happens at this slow speed region, right? As soon as you get here, right? So you can still follow this curve, but you don't get very far into this slow speed region, 
right? And then as you go over here, right, you'll get some penetration into there from the outside. But you notice to get to here, you, uh, you go this way and then into the slow speed thing at the last possible minute. Okay, and then it curves around, curves around. There's gonna be a point at which, right, you'll get uh, some thing like this happening, right? And now you'll notice, right, you got some paths, optimal paths going this way and going this way, right? And there will be a discontinuity that forms, right? Well, it's a derivative discontinuity. So let me put that in. Derivative discontinuity. Oh, there's a question. Is this ever used for seismics? Um, well, I'm not a seismic guy, but this is used in uh, a, a very general thing that's used all the time, which is called geometric optics. Uh, this is a geometric optic um, application. So you could imagine that if you're looking uh, at sort of waves uh, and how they're uh, traveling, uh, this is a limiting description. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah. Possibly uh, seismic waves could be uh, uh, described in this way. Okay, so here is the here is a um, a discontinuity right that forms because basically along this line that's directly uh, you know in line with this, you are equally likely or equally fast to get to this point going on one side or the other side of the of the slow speed uh, region, right and now you can see what our uh, selection principle is. Right? Because I can get to this point following uh, these, these uh, level sets. I could follow those level sets, or I could follow these level sets. The one that you pick is the shortest time. Right? So yes, you can have a solution that follows the level sets on this. Uh, okay, help me out, right or left, right-hand side, right? But that's not what you do once you get to this uh, derivative discontinuity. So there's some selection principle that should go on in these, in these problems. Okay. So um, if you believe, right, that the iconal equation describes that problem. And now you know uh, the weak solution that you want to find out of that. Uh, let me just give you a, a quickie uh, derivation. It's a bit of a hand wavy uh, thing. Uh, so I'll say you can derive it uh, from uh, a level set argument. So this only works uh, in the smooth uh, regions of the, of the solution. Okay, so I'm gonna have a level set. This is why I showed you the picture first, right? Right, so there is uh, where I can get to uh, at, uh, with a time, up to time big U. Uh, and then I can get out a little bit farther uh, if I'm allowed to go a little bit uh, longer in time, and I'm thinking of sigma as being small in this argument, it'll be one of those, you know, let uh, delta something go to zero kind of arguments. Okay, so uh, here I am, I'm sitting on this point, right? That's a, that's a place I can get to in time u. Right, and I'm looking at this point, which I'm going in the normal direction to. So there I am, I'm gonna go in the normal direction. Uh, and that's normal to uh, this uh, original uh, level set, right? Uh, and 
uh, I'll be able to go uh, a distance L in that uh, normal direction uh, uh, before I hit this other level set. So X uh, plus L N hat. Right, I've got my normal direction. Uh, remember uh, from Math 200 or whatever vector calculus course you took that the gradient is perpendicular to the uh, level sets. So uh, I know that the gradient uh, is uh, in uh, the normal direction. And I've even got it uh, with the right sign because the gradient is the, is the direction that points you in the steepest uh, way. So this is uh, the uh, direction of greatest increase of U uh, at perpendicular to the level sets. Now I want the unit normal though. I don't want just the normal direction. So I have to normalize it. Okay, I think there's a comment coming up. Maybe, I missed it. Nope, okay. Uh, so um, unit normal. So, um, well, I know that uh, I can look at sigma, right? Right, that is the, uh, the difference Well, okay, let's just think about this. In fact, sigma is just a, a red herring to, to make things small, right? There's an approximation here, right? But the sigma that I have, right? That's a little bit of a time interval, right? Uh, and if you look at this, right, you would think, well, this is the fastest way almost, right? That I can get from this point to this point, right? And so it has to be uh, the L, right? Divided by the speed, the local speed. Right, so I've got distance, uh, divided by speed, giving me uh, that uh, that time. Okay, and this is not making that a vector. That was just to point it out to you. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to remind you of uh, another uh, math uh, 200 uh, uh, rule, which is uh, if I've got a, a v, a little vector that's small. Uh, and I look at uh, a, a quantity uh, which is uh, uh, different by just a little bit. This is just the chain rule it gives me uh, grad u at c at x dot c, right? With an approximation. This is the linear approximation. This is a Taylor series with two components, right? So now if I look at this one, I get a u at x plus l n hat. Remember, l is small. This should be um, a gradient of u at x dot l n hat. And that should be approximately equal to l over c. And here's where I put in that n at is a grad u over the length of grad u. So now there's some algebra just to do to finish it up, right? This is now the gradient of u dot the gradient of u divided by the length of the gradient of u times L 
is L divided by C. And this is just the length of gradient U squared. And the L's cancel out. I get the length of gradient U is one over C. And I square it. And I get grad U squared is one over C squared. And that's, well, okay, so now this is also true for uh, uh, in 3D, uh, but in 2D, the gradients, uh, length of the gradient squared is UX squared plus UY squared is one over C squared. Okay. So now uh, you, maybe you just believe me, right? That, uh, that the iconal equation describes this uh, shortest time um, uh, uh, problem, uh, but here is a, here's a little quickie uh, hand wavy derivation of it. Um, now what's a little bit interesting is, uh, I guess there's two things. Um, so, uh, one is, uh, you're not just interested in, um, this, uh, function U of X and Y, uh, what you might be interested in is, um, if I am here, what is the sh shortest path, right? The shortest time path that gets me here at that shortest time, right? Okay, and here you can see in this speed one region, you just go straight back to the starting point, right? But in general, right, if you've got these kind of uh, uh, variable C uh, uh, problems, um, so I'll say once you have found, U of X and Y, uh, you can find shortest time paths So you you want to look for a path uh, that starts, Right, that uh, this is the starting point or the, uh, I guess I should say, this is the destination point. So in this picture up here, right here, I'm gonna start here and I wanna figure out this shortest path to get to uh, the where where I could start from, right? Okay, and uh, what you do well in that case, of course, it's clear, right? You just draw a straight line, okay? Uh, but uh, what you do is you uh, solve the following problem. Uh, you um, follow backwards in time, right? Uh, the uh, gradient of U. Now you can sort of see that from this derivation, right? If this was uh, the point you wanted to get to, well, the first place you would want to get to, uh, to get closer to the uh, initial point is to follow this normal uh, backwards. And then you'd have another level set and you'd follow that backwards and so on, right? And then that would trace out the shortest time path to get to here, right? And uh, that's, what you, uh, that's what you do. This is what you solve, right? So this is a gradient flow uh, problem uh, back, to the, uh, back to the origin. Now, just in case you're interested, this is not a class on computational methods. Uh, but I'll say there is a, a nice computational method uh, to uh, uh, solve for 
u of x and y, and it's called the fast marching method. Uh, and it can be generalized to um, to include uh, uh, having a, a vehicle with rotation uh, move through uh, obstacles uh, in a, in an optimal way. So it's it's used in robotics. Okay, so. We've seen this fully nonlinear problem. That's kind of kind of a fun application to think about. Um, let's look at uh, uh, the general solution technique uh, for a general nonlinear problem. Okay, so that's F. This is it, right? Uh, going to depend on x and y, uh, u, u, x, and u, y in some very general uh, nonlinear way. Uh, how do we get, um, oh, I'm sorry. This is a typo in my notes. This was, this was v. This is just the general, uh, the general expression. Uh, I, yeah, I'm sorry about that. There, I put C in my notes, a vector C, and then I thought that would be confusing because I had C as the speed, uh, but then I made it even more confusing by mixing up the two things uh, in this line. This is just the Math 200 linear approximation. So that part had nothing to do with um, uh, this had nothing to do with um, uh, the uh, the problem. Uh, this is this is just um, yeah, just a generic result, which then I use here with this is my v, and so I get uh, that that thing coming out. Okay, thanks for pointing that out. That's that's got to have been confusing for more than just uh, more than just you. Okay, now. Um, here is my my thing, right? So I had uh, you know u uh, x squared plus u y squared minus one is equal to zero. That was my example of the iconal equation, and so this is now um, more general. Now, um, this is less confusing when you've seen it before, okay? But I remember being confused the first time I saw this. Um, uh, now I've got this function. It's a function of five variables. Uh, one of the uh, arguments that it takes is the derivative of the function you're interested in. Uh, but I'm going to need to take partial derivatives of this function with respect to this fourth variable. And I don't want to write the partial derivative of f with respect to ux, because that just looks confusing, OK? So uh, I'm going to call this variable p and this variable q. Of course, we want to make sure that at the end, the thing that comes out as p is really the derivative of u with respect to x, and q is really the derivative of u with respect to y. But with this notation, now I can talk about the derivative of f with respect to p, and, and you know that I mean the derivative of this thing with respect to this fourth argument. So if I took the derivative of this expression with respect to p, I would get 2p or 2ux, okay? So, so there, there you go. There's, a, there's another uh, way, um, that I'm going to uh, be using the p and, and q, which will which will come up. Okay, and so what's worked for us before, which will work here uh, with some um, uh, some extra work, is the following, right? So we we have and and this problem is the same. We're going to have to give some data on a curve. 
I can't call it initial data because I don't know if there's like a time like variable here. So I, I've got just some uh, curve. And uh, on that curve, I've got uh, values of u. Uh, and right here is an S, which is just a, a point on that curve. So I'm going to know that point, uh, the X and Y values, and the value of U at that point. And what's worked for us before is to look at a, a characteristic curve. Uh, and when we had linear problems, uh, right, then uh, I could work out uh, these curves, they didn't depend on the data, right? And then afterwards I could work out uh, how U changed on those curves. Uh, once we had uh, quasi-linear equations, then the characteristics depended on U. So I had to solve for X, Y, and U all at the same time. And uh, in this problem, right, the fully nonlinear problem, we're going to have to uh, solve for x, y, u, and uh, p and q all at the same time. So I'm going to consider uh, u on that curve. I'm going to consider uh, it's x, the x derivative on the curve. and the y derivative on the curve. These things actually are called characteristic strips uh, because what you are um, kind of looking at at every point <clears throat> is not just the value of u, which is like, I don't know, some point above this point, but you're also attaching to it a, a ux and a ui. So you've got a little kind of tangent plane uh, sitting on top of each of these points. And what worked for us uh, before uh, was, okay, without the P and the Q, is we could work out um, that if you solve the partial differential equation, then we could determine the solution on a curve without knowing what was happening off the curve. And we can do the same thing uh, here. So uh, we want to replace uh, the uh, nonlinear PDE uh, with uh, an ODE system for uh, X, Y, U, P and Q. There was an excellent question from a student in a previous lecture, which was, uh, so uh, we're saying we have the solution and we're deriving an ODE for how that solution behaves uh, uh, on these curves. Uh, this is a, a sort of uh, a necessary condition, um, but is it sufficient. And so there's a, a, a complicated inverse function argument to show that once you've done this, you really have to find a local uh, unique solution of the PDEs. By local, I mean there is some um, little uh, 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 area around the data curve where you have a, a real solution of the PDE. Okay, so that's what will come from this. Now, uh, in, the, in the place where I learned this, uh, it's like uh, the, the, the uh, presenter just said, hey, this is what X dot and Y dot have to be, right, for the whole thing to work. Well, okay, I, I, wanna, I wanna go through a little bit of the process uh, now, okay? So uh, let's say uh, you didn't have that. Uh, handed to you on a platter, you're wondering uh, what what to do. Okay, so, well, now in general though, remember 
This is d by dt of u of x of t and y of t. Uh, and so I can just use the chain rule, right? I'm gonna get u x x dot uh, plus u y y dot. This is a p x dot plus q y dot. Okay, well that, that looks okay, right? I would really like this to be uh, just uh, something in terms of F, X, Y, U, P, and Q, if I'm gonna make it into an ODE system, but, but, uh, but okay, well, we'll leave it for here. Uh, now let's look at P dot. Well, this is D by DT of U, X at X, T, Y, of T. Right, and I can do the same chain rule. I'm gonna get u x x x dot uh, plus u x y y dot. And similarly, q dot is u x y x dot plus u y y y dot. Okay, and uh, in my notes, right, uh, there is a little sad face right, looking at those expressions, right, because what I was trying to do was to get an ODE system for X, Y, P, and Q, but now it looks like uh, I've got stuff which uh, involves higher derivatives. And so if I introduce those higher derivatives, then uh, the ODE that they satisfy will have even more high derivatives and it'll be a, a loop I can't close. Uh, but how we closed things uh, before uh, was we used the PDE. So let's have a look at the PDE, All right? So I have F of X, Y, U, uh, U, X, uh, U, Y is equal to zero. Uh, and I'm gonna take the X derivative of that. Not on characteristics, just at every uh, point. I'm, I'm thinking I got a solution, right? So I'm gonna have the derivative, partial derivative of F with respect to X. Y doesn't depend on X, so I don't get anything there. Now I get the partial derivative of F with respect to U, UX. Here's where this P and Q become useful uh, again, right? I can talk about the partial derivative with respect to the fourth argument. And then I get uxx plus fq uh, uxy. This is all equal to zero at every point in space. Okay, and so now I, I, I can um, uh, motivate the thing uh, which I could have just said right at the beginning but then you would wonder where it came from. Now you can sort of go, well, these are terms I didn't like, right? These, these terms, right? But if I pick X dot to be the derivative of F with respect to P and Y dot to be the derivative of F with respect to Q, right, on the characteristic, then I can replace these terms with terms that don't involve higher derivatives, okay? So that's the game. So now I, I'm gonna say pattern matching here to here, right? I'm gonna say it looks like uh, I should take uh, X dot is the partial derivative of F with P, Y dot is FQ. And then I put that in here. Oh, sorry. I put that in, uh, in here. Uh, and I get uh, that P dot is minus FX plus F u times p, right? That does not involve higher derivatives. Uh, and similarly, 
if I take uh, uh, F uh, Y and look at that, uh, I'll uh, derive a Q dot is a minus F Y plus F U times Q. I got to have uh, five ODEs for my five uh, 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 unknowns. Uh, and I can certainly go back. Now I've got X dot is F, uh, is F P. Uh, y dot is F Q. Uh, and now here I've got that this is P F P plus Q F Q. So one, two, uh, five are the ODE system for uh, X, Y, U, P, and Q on these curves. So now I can take that system and I can solve and get uh, not only the solution U, but also it's uh, X and Y derivatives uh, on these lines. And then of course, as I vary S, I can get other lines. And this is where the inverse function theorem argument comes in, that those, uh, all of those characteristics coming out of every point S fill up at least a local solution around the, around the curve, right? Might not be solved everywhere. And we already know from the iconal equation that we're gonna get, um, uh, uh, derivative discontinuities, at least in the solutions where, you know, the, the solution, there's some question marks about, uh, about what to do. So this is all just uh, the local smooth solution existence um, uh, technique. Okay. Um, I've only got one minute. So there's an example where I take it through uh, and I solve the iconal equation in the, in the circle, the solution you already know. It's, it's the easiest case because you can see this is, gets pretty messy. Uh, but is anyone concerned about this ODE system? I mean, one minute to go, maybe you're only concerned about like whatever you have to go and do next. Okay. The only thing uh, I don't personally understand is the final step where you got P dot and Q dot. Did you use, um, did you like plug in both the different P dots and Q dots? And then each of those gives its own equation. Like from a, if you go above a little bit um, where you said, yeah. So the top where you said, uh, looks like I should take blah, blah, blah. Did you also do that with the Q dot? Oh, oh, you did. The arrow splits up. I didn't see that. Or does it? So did, did you only plug in the top equation or did you plug in the, the top one and the bottom one and they each give you a different equation respectively? Oh, yeah. So uh, this and this, these are two different equations. Um, I didn't take the uh, y derivative, but if I took the y derivative, I'd get this. So the bottom one gave you the y, like y derivative, like q dot, then this, the question or equation yeah, this, number five. This one uh, it comes from, from this. Okay, okay. When I take the y derivative of the, of the differential equation. Um, the, um, the thing that you should be a little bit concerned about, okay? But, but this is only, you know, uh, like a meta, meta, you know, worry is um, you've got initial conditions sitting there for these quantities, uh, but it's an ODE system for five variables. You need five initial conditions, right? You need uh, P a zero of S and Q zero of S. Uh, if you're gonna start off from here, and solve this system of five ODEs to get the solution on this characteristic line, you need to know uh, initial conditions for those derivatives. Uh, and there's, um, uh, there's uh, something in the, in the, you can look in the notes. 
I'll just say, because now we're at minus two minutes. Um, and here's where the uh, uh, non-uniqueness of solutions comes. So if you look at the iconal equation for the two examples that I gave where there were two solutions, it's that there's two choices uh, for uh, consistent in initial conditions for the uh, X and Y derivatives coming from the equations. And for a given choice, there's a unique solution, uh, but because there's two choices, there's two, two solutions you can, you can take. Um, I'm gonna let you look through the notes for um, uh, this worked out for an example, which is the iconal equation. Uh, there's not many examples where you can really uh, make progress on these kind of things uh, analytically. Uh, it's a sort of theoretical uh, tool to understand how these equations behave. Um, and then in terms of uh, numerical methods, uh, for the iconal equation, like I say, there's this fast uh, marching method, uh, which has a bunch of generalizations and some interesting applications you might want to look at. Okay, so uh, that ends the lecture. I'll stop recording, but as always, I'll stick around and answer any questions that you might have.